is correct. Yeah. And, and both both of those will be available to anybody into the future. Is that the idea? Right. Yeah, that's great. For a month. For, oh, only for a month. Yeah. Oh, and then it's gone forever. Well, we or, we're we only have so much storage space. Is right. our challenge. Is there any way I can get the video for myself of my yeah. talk? Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would like that. Yeah. If I can. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we are live now. We have a few minutes until seven. Okay. People have been telling me about all the fancy backgrounds you can have for your talks, and I just haven't gotten into that yet. So I hope, and fortunately, you know, when I go to the little tiny rectangle, I'm not very, I'm not very distracting because. You can barely see what's behind me, I guess. Yeah, so that works okay. I think I have a, you know, I have a map of just Alaska back there. You have the whole world and I have Alaska, yeah. I have a world map in another room. And these are just all my slides, 65,000 slides in those boxes back there. And all of my books are in other rooms. We have way too much stuff. <laughs> I guess that's what we do as we go through life. We gather, hunt and gather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's almost seven o'clock. We are recording now. I guess both of you must be a lot closer to your cameras than I am. I'm sitting back in my chair here. So it is now a seven o'clock. Uh, so I think we'll start. And I want to start by welcoming everyone to the 2021 uh, BirdFest keynote address with Dennis Paulson, who will be speaking about the wonderful adaptations of birds. And just a few housekeeping notes. Um, some of us, uh, some of you are joining us by Zoom and some are joining by live streaming on Facebook. And our event is also being recorded. And it will that recording will be available for a month uh, on our YouTube channel and with a link on our um, uh, website. So whether you're joining us by Zoom, by Facebook, or watching a recording two weeks from now, Welcome to all of you. And Dennis welcomes questions. And the best way to ask a question is if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A and you can put your question into the Q&A. And then we'll actually address those questions at the end of Dennis's talk. And I will read those questions out to Dennis um, and we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, so I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the Wenatchee River Institute worked with the Piscosa or Wenatchee people to put this acknowledgement together. The land the Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shin Piscoshu or Piscosa Wenatchee people. The Shin Piscoshu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River. Their ancestral homeland extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. The culture and economy of the Pescosa people centered on fishing. They also gathered roots and berries, basket making materials and medicines. They also hunted game. The Pescosa are named within the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee Reservation was never followed through, even with the needed surveying completed. Many Pascosa now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. 
The Pascosa people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture within their homelands and are working to get land back within the ancestral homelands. The Pascosa people are the original stewards of this land. We offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying indigenous voices and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We encourage all to learn about the indigenous peoples of the place you now call home. So my name is Carolyn Griffin Bugert and I'm the executive director of the Wenatchee River Institute. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Wenatchee River Institute, we are an environmental learning center located in Leavenworth, Washington with programs for youth and adults. Our mission is to connect people, communities and the natural world. BirdFest is one of many, many educational opportunities we offer. And I'd encourage you to go to our website to see the other things that are going on. There's quite a few things. So I would like to share my screen for a moment here. Better. And start with, um, and we really wanna start by thanking our sponsors. And it's these sponsors that help registration, that, that helps to keep registration for BirdFest events low. These sponsors are the reason you can spend eight hours on a birding trip with a trained biologist and only pay $30. So this slide shows all the businesses and organization that supported last year's BirdFest. And the five organizations at the top of the page stepped forward to support this year's event, most without even being asked. Just as they are supporting BirdFest, I would encourage you to support these organizations. So BirdFest is put on by two organizations, the Wenatchee River Institute and the North Central Washington Audubon Society. And this year we are excited to announce the rollout of our Founders Award. This award is sponsored by the Wenatchee Naturalist Program and was created to honor the volunteerism of the festival. In 2003, three organizations came together to launch BirdFest. So this is our 19th year. Within the, these three organizations were three creative, energetic and visionary women who co-chaired the BirdFest steering committee. The Founders Award is inspired by these three organizations and these women. But as you all know, events take more than just inspirational leaders. They also take a team of people working together to put on all aspects of the event. The Founders Award honors and recognizes all the other hardworking members of the steering committee who are listed on this slide. In addition to these individuals, there were dozens of people from local businesses, nonprofits, agencies, and individuals that were part of putting on the first event. It was a huge collaborative and creative affair. It was connected with the World Migratory Bird Day. It celebrated the way people and birds are connected between all of the Americas. It brought together conservation, science, art, and culture. The founding of the Leavenworth Spring Bird Fest really is a story of collaboration and the spirit of volunteerism. Next year, Audubon and the Wenatchee River Institute will select the first award recipient, recognizing exceptional volunteer service to the festival. And we will have a perpetual plaque posted in the BirdFest room at the Wenatchee River Institute with each year's award recipient. So I'm gonna stop my screen share 
And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dennis Paulson. So Dennis grew up in Miami, exposed to nature in all its glory while Southern Florida was still largely unspoiled. He received his PhD in zoology from the University of Miami with a study of the dragonflies of Southern Florida. And shortly thereafter, he moved to Seattle where he has lived ever since. He retired as the director of the Slater Museum of Natural History at the University of Puget Sound. Dennis has taught at three universities and continues to teach adult education courses in many venues, including the long running Seattle Audubon Society Master Birders Program. He has also led nature tours and traveled on his own to all continents. And he has studied dragonflies and birds worldwide and published over a hundred scientific papers and a dozen books, mostly on his favorite animals. He is an enthusiastic nature photographer and he was sharing with us that all of his slides today, except for one, were taken by himself. And he's had photos published in magazines, books and interpretive displays. And with that, let me turn it over to Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, for joining us. My pleasure. I guess I should share my screen. I'm happy to be here. And I'd like to tell you something about birds that uh, excite me. I've been interested in birds all of my adult life. I started as a birder at 11 years old, started keeping a life list in Miami and just uh, never stopped being interested in these creatures. And, and I love to teach about them as well. So here's something about them. And I have to click on this to get this started. Birds are all around us pretty much. They're, uh, most of them are diurnal, active in the daytime. Many of them are, even, even the smallest ones are large enough to be noticed by us. And they're, they're active creatures, they fly around. Uh, they're, they're in our yard, they're anywhere we go. If we go out fishing, we're surrounded by gulls. Uh, if we're farmers, we may have birds feeding in the fields even as we uh, are, are doing our job there. And so you really almost can't get away from them, which is such a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, if we didn't have bird feeders in our yard, we would see birds, but I don't think we'd see very many. Some of them would be passing through. They'd, some birds hold territories, hold territories in our neighborhoods and we'd hear them singing and see them occasionally. But because we really want to see birds and enjoy them, we put up bird feeders and boy, do they attract birds. They make all the difference in the world. Uh, you can get comparisons of similar species on these feeders. And, I'm, and notice the names. I'm not saying the names in many cases because I have them written there. Some of these will be foreign birds that you may have never even heard of. And so you can see their names there. And maybe if you, if you miss something, you can actually come back and, and check out the video again. Uh, again, compare similar species at feeders. I'm, I'm wonderful. I'm always trying to get black capped and chestnut back chickadees together at the feeder and things that I can uh, photograph at the same time. And then you, and almost anywhere in the world you go traveling, if you're a naturalist and you go to ecotourism lodges, they have feeders too. And that's a, been a wonderful thing about my travels and to most of the continents. So stay at the, the right sort of lodges and they have bird feeders and they attract birds right out of the forest that you might not even see yourself. Uh, incredible birds like keel-billed toucans and brown-hooded parrot feeding its young, right on the, going to the feeder, getting some seeds or getting bananas in this case, bringing it over to the begging young bird and feeding it. Any continent, king parrots and, and all sorts of parrots come to uh, bird feeders in Australia, just a wonderful thing to see. And interesting thing, something I've just learned very recently, when I was a beginning birder, we thought there were about 8,600 species of birds in the world. And that was it. And of course, some, some were discovered and named after that. And with a lot of genetic work, a lot of work on DNA, people started splitting up more birds and more birds. So fairly recently, the estimate of species has been around 10,000 species. But now a new paper just came out. Some, some ornithologists did some very careful studies of 200 species of birds picked somewhat randomly. And they decided that with very looking at all aspects of their of their life, of their coloration, their size, their shape, length of the relative length of the tail, uh, their behavior, their nesting behavior, and uh, often in many cases their vocalizations. And this is without doing any genetic work at all. They realized that for these 200 species, uh, quite a few of them could be divided into two or three species. 
So they came up with a new estimate that we may well have 18,000 species of birds on the earth, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> they range in size from the tiny vervain hummingbird of Jamaica and the bee hummingbird of Cuba is very, very, very slightly smaller than that to be the smallest bird of the world to the ostrich, which is uh, some 75,000 times larger. So what an incredible uh, array of species of birds that we really have 18,000 of them and they vary that much. Uh, they vary in color all over the rainbow and some colors that maybe aren't in the rainbow like white. Why are birds white? Why are so many birds white? Well, white facilitates flocking. White is a very conspicuous color against almost any uh, environment, maybe not snow, but anyway, so many birds that flock are white or mostly white because apparently just for no other reason that they can be seen more easily and birds can come together in flocks more easily that way like these snow geese. But many birds are black as well. How about black? Well, here's a swan that's black even, that's pretty amazing. Uh, black seems to have about the same function as white. It facilitates flocking. Many, many, many kinds of flocking birds are white. Uh, perhaps more water birds uh, are white, perhaps more land birds are black, but they seem to be uh, functioning pretty much the same way. Big flocks of crows that we see. Starlings, starlings are little black birds and boy are they flockers. They get together in these incredible murmurations. They come together in huge flocks as they're coming to roost at night and fly around and around the sky. I hope all of you have been able to see videos of these murmurations of starlings. And this group sort of looks like an egg to me. This was down in Astoria, Oregon one evening and stayed that way for some time till the egg was cracked by a peregrine falcon flying right through. It actually flew right through this flock. Didn't get a single starling, flew through it three or four times. Never caught one, but really created an amazing show in the air. Uh, all the colors, as I say, blue is very common in birds. Blue is a structural color reflecting, uh, absorbing all the other wavelengths of the spectrum, but reflecting blue. And a lot of our beautiful birds are blue. Blue is my favorite color, so I can really appreciate them. Uh, some, some birds are just unbelievably blue, like splendid fairy wrens in Australia. Red, red is a common color in birds. Again, both blue and red are very showy. They're surely uh, there for showing the bird off, uh, displaying males, trying to repel other males from their territory or attract mates. A lot of bright red, beautiful birds. Uh, even some large birds that are red. Here's a roseate spoonbill that is a flocking bird like the so many white birds, the herons and ibises that are white and it's related to them. And probably it just adds that little bit of color to be that much more special. And of course, not only do the birds themselves, the feathers themselves have spectacular colors like this purple gallinule, but even the bare parts too, the bills and the feet of many birds are brightly colored. I don't think you can beat the, the bill of a purple gallinule alone. And sometimes the color is localized to the eyes. Many birds have brightly colored eyes like this glossy star, but iridescence is another feature of bird feathers. Feathers are structured in a particular way to sort of reflect the light. And like many iridescent things, they sort of change color as they, as they change their positions, but something that the, the starling family has really perfected. And eye color can be subtle. Sometimes birds look dull overall, but if you look more closely, you see they have a very, very special eye color. Almost all cormorants have emerald green eyes, really wonderful to look at at close range. Brant's cormorants on our coaster have blue eyes. And this tanager is one of many tanagers that are multicolored. Uh, in fact, I think even one tanager is called a multicolored tanager. They're just, they, they blow your mind with how many different colors they have in that different combinations. You can see feeding flocks of tanagers in the, in the Andes in Ecuador that have 10 species, each one a different color. Uh, some of that color is subtle, some of it's hidden. A ruby crown kinglet male goes around looking like a very drab little bird until it start until the breeding season comes along and it starts singing and displaying, then any chance it gets, it raises that crest. Now, those red feathers are completely hidden until the bird is displaying in the breeding season, then they can be shown off very nicely. The same is true for the wing and the tail feathers of a, uh, of a uh, sun bitter. This is the tail actually here, and this is the wing. Both the wing and the tail have these incredibly bright bands that are completely hidden. This bird is quite camouflaged or cryptic as it moves along the shore of a tropical river foraging on, on, on crustaceans and insects. And yet when it displays in the breeding season, it opens those wings and just amazing. 
But then there are birds that don't want to be seen, that want to be hidden. Birds like poor wills and other night jars that are active at night. And so they really, and they really display a lot by using their voices. And some of them have white tail feathers and other ways they can display when they fly. But in the daytime, they really want to be hidden. I've never yet been able to photograph a poor will in the daytime because anytime I've seen one, it's, I've flushed it. It saw me before I saw it and it flushed it and it flew away. But at night, along some of our roads, you can drive along the road slowly with a flashlight. You can see a reflection in the eye of a poor will. Get out of your car, walk over near it, uh, take a couple of flash photos and not even, not the bird doesn't even fly. It just sits there and then you, then you move on again. Uh, one ornithologist who studied owls and night birds in general claimed that the common poor will was the most beautiful bird in the world. So you see, it's all, it all depends on your perspective. Green is a great color to be. If you feed in the forest, there are lots and lots of green birds. Parrots are really commandeered that color. The great majority of parrots are green, some shade or other, very well camouflaged when they're in a tree. They can even be in a tree in big flocks. I've seen flocks of 20 parrots fly into a big tropical forest tree and just completely disappear. You absolutely cannot see them once they land. And then they fly, many of them have red or, or brightly colored yellow or blue in their wings or tail. As soon as they fly, then you can see them again. Owls, owls again are like poor wills. They're nocturnal. Uh, there's, they don't really, they're not active in the daytime, so there's no reason to display bright colors, so they're cryptically colored, camouflage. Spotted owl is a good example of that. So birds came from dinosaurs, I'm sure most of you know that, uh, a long, long time from dinosaurs related to Tyrannosaurus rex even. And some time ago, in, in over a century ago in Germany, uh, some beautiful fossils were found, Ar Archaeopteryx lithographica, which was determined to be about 150 million years ago. And this was thought, this was thought to be the, the primal bird. Uh, it's a, it very much like a bird in some ways. It's got feathers, got a big, nice big wing feathers that clearly could fly. Uh, but it has teeth like a reptile, and it has a long tail like a reptile. And the claws are sort of like reptiles. So this was really, we really knew that birds had come from reptiles, that this, this creature was intermediate between a bird and reptile. And not too much more was known about that, but more recently, tremendous finds of dinosaurs have shown that there was one group of dinosaurs that evolved feathers. They probably evolved feathers for insulation. Uh, they certainly didn't have wings or anything like that. But as this group developed, they started developing longer and longer forearms and the feathers grew longer and longer and stiffer and eventually they were able to fly. And at that point they were on their way to becoming birds. And that's of course, one of the most wonderful thing about birds is that they fly. We can both admire their flight and envy them that they can be up in the air when we can't. And one of the things that makes that possible, many things do, but one of the things that's very obvious are their hollow bones. This is the humerus, the upper wing bone of a brown pelican. And I, I sawed it in half to show the, uh, uh, the, the hollowness of it. Of course, it's very strong. It's got all those struts through it, uh, sort of like model airplanes we've made in the past. And yet it is mostly hollow. So it's very, very light for its size and strength. And that's why bird, one of the ways, reasons that birds can fly. Uh, another reason is a tail. Birds not only have these big wings with, their, with all their feathers, but they have a tail of various uh, lengths and sizes and shapes. And the tail is also part of the flight surface. So you could really call the wings and the tail together the flight feathers. They're both, both very important for supporting the bird in the air. Of course, not all birds fly. There are some birds that are just too big and heavy to fly. These flightless ratites, as they're called, are characteristic of the southern continents. Uh, emus in Australia, cassowaries in Australia and New Guinea, uh, rheas in Argentina and ostriches in Africa, uh, wonderful big running birds. An ostrich can run faster than some of the mammals that it shares the African plains with. And there are birds that have sort of regressed. There are birds that come from birds from flighted groups that have lost the ability to fly like flightless cormorants and like a various, uh, some kinds of rails that live on uh, islands in the Pacific. They really have no reason to fly. They're not going anywhere. They can do all their foraging either in the water like the cormorant does or on land like the rails do and get along without wings. So they just uh, over time, over evolutionary time, have just lost that ability. And notice that reptile ancestor on the rock, that Galapagos marine iguana. The heaviest birds that can fly is the quarry bustard, very, very large bustard. 
in Af all, all over Africa, weighs up to 42 pounds. That doesn't seem all that heavy, but that seems to be about the largest, the heaviest weight that a flying bird could carry at this point. Trumpeter swans are our largest flying birds in North America. They can weigh up to 32 or 30, 33 pounds, uh, darn near getting close to the quarry bustard. So these wings and tails are important when a bird takes off. They flap them and take off into the air. They're important in slowing the bird down, not only the wings, but the widespread tail as they come in for a landing. And they support them in the air as they fly through the sky. Great blue herons can be migratory. They can fly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of miles in migration with those big broad wings. And they come in all, the wings come in all shapes. Uh, long pointed wings for effortless flying through the air and the tail here you can see how helpful the tail is in flight. This long pork tail can be twisted and turned in a way to make this bird incredibly agile and maneuverable in the air. Uh, my favorite bird by the way. But then here's a bird that doesn't really use its tail very much. It's got it's sort of all wings, an albatross. Albatross with those very long wings are adapted for gliding. They ride the air currents uh, over the ocean where there's usually quite a bit of air circulation and they're uh, adapted to use those air currents to stay in the air. Uh, when they're on the water, they have to flap their wings and paddle like crazy to take off. But once they get into the air, they can stay there. Albatrosses fly all the way around the Southern hemisphere in the course of their lives. Some of the species south of South America and, and Africa and land occasionally to feed, but otherwise they're in the air a tremendous amount fly thousands of miles. Now, the other adaptations in, in wings, owls with their silent flight, they fly at night and they can capture rodents because they don't make any noise as they approach them in the air. And the uh, fore edge of the outermost primary on the wings have these beautiful fringes on them to deaden the sound that other birds would make with a certain, which a much stiffer feather. And then there's feeding. Obviously, all living creatures, all living animals have to feed. And so birds are the same. And here's a simplified diagram of bird feeding adaptations. And of course, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, a lot of birds are adapted to eat small animals, small mammals, small birds, reptiles, amphibians, land, vertebrates. Uh, fortunately for us, there's no bird adapted to eat elephants. That, that never seemed to have evolved. They might be interested in people as well. But most of these birds we call raptors, uh, owls and hawks and their relatives. They have talons at the end of their legs. They have long, sharp, curved claws that they can grasp with. Uh, they have four of them, so they can easily hold on to potential prey. They have a raptorial bill, a, long, a curved bill that can tear flesh, and that's, that's how they eat these larger animals, larger prey. Uh, raptors, hawks come in different variety, different shapes really for different foraging strategies. Uh, Red-tailed hawks and eagles like that, they have broad wings and broad tails that lift them up into the air on thermals and wind currents so they can sail through the sky, watching for prey below and diving on it. Uh, raptors that eat birds sort of have evolved into two sort of directions like our occipiters or forest falcons have short rounded wings and long tails so they can fly very rapidly they can accelerate rapidly the long tail allows them to steer effectively they can fly rapidly through woodlands and surprise birds on the ground or on or on uh, perches and grab them in my yard i've had four band-tailed pigeons caught by Cooper's hawks in the 30 years we've lived here, managed to see and photograph each of these occasions, just an amazing thing to see. But then there are other kinds of falcons that are specialized for pursuit. Uh, peregrine falcons, fastest bird in the world, as we know, can chase down a bird in flight. And something a red-tailed hawk or a forest falcon can't do so well. And again, the pointed, the pointed wings give it really high speed. They're very good. They have a lot of speed in a wing sh uh, that shape. And then there are even, there's even a raptor that hunts on the ground. Secretary birds with their long legs stride through the grasses of the African plains looking for snakes, lizards, mice, even small birds that they can then jump on and with their feet and capture. And then there are other soaring birds as well. Quite a few kinds of birds soar. Some of them use soaring behavior in migration. Uh, some migratory hawks 
can fly all the way from the US to South America, barely flapping their wings, barely. The only time they flap their wings is when they come in for a landing at night and they take off again in the morning. Uh, and then there are a whole group of birds that uh, are adapted for looking for prey, but not for live prey, for dead prey, for carrion, like California condors and various kinds of vultures. Uh, these black vultures have found a, a dead bloated caiman on the riverbank. And I suppose they were sitting there trying to figure out how they were going to get through those thick reptiles uh, scales. And there are plenty of other birds besides the actual official raptors that eat small animals. Corvids, especially crows and ravens, are predators just about as effective as those predatory birds with their special adaptations. A raven or a crow can just dive on a something like a snake or a small bird and peck it to death very quickly and take it home and eat it. Then there are water birds. There's a tremendous amount of ocean in the world. A, the ocean takes up much of the world, high percentage, and freshwater bodies are present a, a lot more feeding uh, opportunities for birds. And so waterfowl are a good example of that. These mallards uh, have little lamellae or plates on the edge of their bill. They dip into the water like that. They take a mouthful, a bill full of water with plants or, or small animals in it and close the bill and the water squirts out through these plates and they, they retain the, the uh, prey, prey, prey animal or plant that they've captured that way. Uh, shovelers are the most extreme uh, uh, examples of that. The plates on their bills are extremely fine, uh, very much like uh, the baleen of a, of a whale, of a, of a big baleen whale. And so they slurp their way through the water uh, again, pushing the water out through these plates, but retaining even very small plants and animals that are that they take out of the water that way and swallowing them. Flamingos feed the same way, totally unrelated to waterfowl, but they have similar plates in their bills and they feed with their bill upside down, but do the very same thing. They strain small crustaceans, which can be very dense in saline waters uh, in tropical areas. Then there are the birds that go underwater. Obviously, the oceans are deep and, and many freshwater lakes are deep. And so to capture prey, you go underwater. Many of these are fish eaters. Cormorants are fish eaters. Brand, this branch cormorant shown in a series of dive, jumps out of the water, penetrates the water with that long bill and neck. And then as it hits the water, it starts paddling with its feet to take it down like this double-crested cormorant is doing big webbed feet to move them underwater. Again, some wonderful videos online showing cormorants swimming underwater. Cormorants have all four toes connect. All, almost all birds have four toes and mallards and things like that have three of them connected by webs. Cormorants have all four connected by webs. So they're really effective swimmers and can chase fish down. Not all swimming birds have webbed feet. Some of them have lobed toes instead of a web connecting the toes, coots and greaves have each toe lobed and pr providing a pretty good a, a propulsive surface for them to swim through the water and even dive. Coots aren't very good at diving. Greaves, on the other hand, with their lobed feet are terrific at diving and they go underwater just like the cormorants do to, to chase and capture fish. And then there's another kind of diver, a wing propelled diver. Guillemots, murres, and puffins belong to that group. Uh, they're swimming on the surface and they decide to go under, they open their wings and they go under. Uh, you can see what the, the feet do here. They flip up a little bit of water and they're opening the wings and they're actually swimming underwater with their wings. You can see this guillemot's wings open here and they're very effective at doing that. They can chase fish that way, just like a cormorant or a reeve can underwater with their feet. A lot of these fish eating birds, of course, take other things, common loons, probably eat largely fish like this one with a, a a sickleback here, very small prey for a big bird, and they also eat a lot of crabs. Uh, there's more, the, many of the fish eating birds just have a pointed bill. So I said, mentioned that like the loon, they very good for grabbing something underwater. Cormorants take that a little further by having a hook at the end, and they can actually pierce their prey and hold onto it more effectively before they swallow it. All these birds hold the fish out of water while they're, while they're eating or while they're after they've captured it, basically I think to suffocate the fish, the fish dies of in the air just as we would die underwater by drowning. And then that makes something like a catfish 
uh, less likely to erect, erect its spines and pierce the uh, esophagus of the cormorant as it was swallowing it. They take amazingly large prey, some of these fish eating birds. I watched this bird swallow this, this catfish. Mergansers are ducks. They have the same plates on the side of their bills that the other ducks do, but their bills are long and slender and those plates have been modified into tooth-like structures. So they're just as effective as catching fish underwater. They're the only fish eating ducks. These, as you can tell, are, are study skins in a museum or skeletons. Herons and egrets wade around in shallow water looking for their fish. When they see one, they, they hold their neck in a, in a crook in an S shape and they can straighten it rapidly to grab something. This great egret grabbed you just a little tiny uh, killifish here, but I guess that was a good enough reward for the energy put out. Some fish eating birds uh, dive from a perch like kingfishers of all kinds. Little tiny kingfisher here in Madagascar with a pretty good sized fish. And then there's some really big birds that dive for their fish as well from the air. This brown pelican is one of only two species of pelicans that dive from the air. All the others feed while paddling along the water and, uh, and thrusting their bill into the water. But this, this brown pelican and the Peruvian pelican dive sometimes from amazingly great heights. And as they dive, they straighten out and point their bill down and hit the water with their wings back. And they have a huge pouch that opens at that time. And that pouch engulfs whatever fish or even several fish that they've dived for. And then they sit on the water, throw their head back and swallow the fish. This pelican is actually uh, airing out and stretching its pouch. Apparently the pouch can get a little stiff at times. So you see pelicans uh, uh, opening their bill and you can see how much the bill can open so as that pouch spreads out and just holding it like this kind of an amazing thing to see. Shorebirds, there are many birds that feed along the shore that feed at the interface between the water and the shore. shore and sandpipers and plovers, of course, the best examples of those. They have different length, they're different size and different lengths. You can get a whole bunch of species of sandpipers feeding along the same shore, differing in the way they forage and the length of their bill. The longer billed ones can go in deeper water or deeper into the mud. Uh, and they really get into it at times. They'll put their head right underwater. Shorebirds are, are sandpipers are wonderful. They have uh, corpse corpuscles, herbs corpuscles, sensory pits at the tip of their bills. So this dowager can stick its bill down into the mud and it could actually feel some little amphipod or worm squirming because of those sensory pits, grab it with the bill and the bill tip can actually open. The bill is not is flexible. So the tip of the bill can open and grab that little creature, pull it out, and swallow it. Oyster catchers have a very solid bill, but it's shaped like a chisel. They can use that bill to break the shell of a mussel or cut, uh, or cut the uh, adductor muscle of, a muscle of a mussel shell so it opens up, or they can scrape limpets. They can pry limpets off rocks. Notice here, this bird has pried a limpet off a rock and it has very amazingly quickly taken it from its shell and whipped its head around and the shell is sailing through the air now here and it'll swallow the animal. Avocets are shorebirds with up tilt bill. It's apparently a really good shape for sweeping it back and forth through the water. They move through the water rapidly, sweeping their bill back and forth. And when it touches something, they open the bill and grab it, usually a small fish or crustacean. They move along very rapidly to do that. Uh, Jacanas are shorebirds with very, very long toes uh, for walking on the surfaces of tropical ponds on floating fern or water lettuce or water hyacinth, as you see here, and looking for insects mostly. All these different adaptations in the same group of birds. Uh, feeding is obviously an extremely, there's, there's nothing more important than feeding, even if you can spend your life without ever being taken or threatened by a predator, you still have to eat every day. So feeding adaptations are really, really important. Some birds even use other birds to get their food. This is called kleptoparasitism. When a, when a bird uh, takes, or, or any other animal that, for that matter, takes prey from, from, the, from the animal that has caught it. This coot has come up from diving. Widgeons can't dive. So they hang around coots. The coot dives, brings up some plant matter. Widgeon rushes over and actually takes it right out of its bill. And that's not all that violent. A lot more violent is when a frigate bird goes after a tern or gull that has caught a fish. We watched this frigate bird chase this turn around for several minutes and it finally grabbed the turn by the tail and shook it and the turn dropped the fish. 
and the frigate bird got it before it hit the water. Just the agility of frigate birds has to be seen to be believed. Turns are agile enough, but the frigate can actually outfly the turn. That long forked tail gives it a tremendous agility. The long narrow wings give it tremendous speed. And unfortunately, the, when it actually got the fish, it was out of focus and I cursed my camera. Uh, you can see uh, even birds of the same species taking prey from each other. Double-crested cormorants, which I watch off the pier at Edmonds near Seattle here, uh, very commonly do this. A cormorant will bring up a fish and another cormorant will, will head for it. Apparently easier to take it from one of your buddies than it is to catch it yourself. And this one uh, successfully took that fish from the other cormorant. Insects. Insects are far and away the most abundant creatures on, on land. Uh, they're not so much in the water, in salt water, but on land and fresh water. There are way over a million species of insects. Their biomass is greater than that of all the vertebrates on Earth, from mice to elephants. So there's just a lot of insects. So as you might expect, a very, very large number of birds eat insects. And not only birds, but frogs and salamanders and lizards and small mammals. They're really important prey. There are birds that glean them from the vegetation or the branches, like warblers and chickadees. These little short pointed bills act like forceps. They can move around and find a caterpillar or some other small insect and grab it with the bill and swallow it. So these are called gleaners. Then there are salliers or flycatchers that sit on a branch quietly. They sort of sit and wait hunters and they see a small insect flying past and they fly out into the air and catch it. Uh, the flattened bill is, is a good adaptation for that. And many, many, many kinds of fly catching birds, all the way from the tiny little toady on the left to great big mot mots and trogons and other things that sit and wait and catch large insects like caterpillars and large, uh, sorry, like katydids, and large moths. Then there are the flying insect catchers, flyers, sal the uh, hawkers, as I call them, swallows are the best example of that. Small, bill, but a very wide gape. And so they can see an insect in front of them, maneuver very well. Barn swallows with their very long fork tails are the by far and away the best maneuvering of our swallows. And they're the lowest flying. So they can fly around bushes and other obstacles and look for the low flying insects while the shorter tailed swallows are up higher. Swifts are sort of more like the shorter tailed swallows. They have long, narrow wings. They fly really, really fast. They can see an insect way in front of them, change course and just swoop up on it and the insect doesn't really have a chance. They don't really have, swallows and swifts don't really have feet for walking, just little tiny feet to sit on a purse. They really have no reason to walk through the vegetation or anywhere, they're really flying, flying machines. Uh, a lot of insect eaters, there's all sorts of insect eaters. There's some that are, uh, specialized for feeding on tree trunks like nuthatches and creepers with long, uh, long curved claws and strong leg muscles that can move in any direction. And probably woodpeckers are the, are the best adapted as trunk and branch feeders with again, long curved claws uh, with toes that go in four directions so they can move in any direction uh, around the stem or up and down. Uh, stiff tail feathers that uh, serve as a prop for hanging onto wood and a very long tongue that can be protruded to great lengths, longer than this flicker has done with barbs at the end. And they can make a hole in a tree, reach that tongue in and spear a beetle larva and pull it out and swallow it. Some woodpeckers are specialists in making sap wells, sap suckers of several species, uh, drill these sap wells in trees and then come back and feast on the sap that forms there as it runs down or up the tree. And they can basically live on that sap during the winter when there are no insects available. And that sap, those sap wells are pretty much a permanent feature of the tree, at least for a while. So dependable with food that birds like hummingbirds and kinglets and warblers and squirrels visit them and take some of the sap and the sap suckers not present. There are woodpecker-like birds in Africa called oxpeckers. They creep up and down the bodies of rhinoceroses and elands and giraffes and, and hippos and pick ticks and other parasites off them. They move just like woodpeckers, but actually on large animal, large mammals. There are birds with long slender bills like thrashers in our Southwest and hoopoos in the old world that can dig into the ground to dig out earthworms and beetle larvae. 
And of course, we have our own worm eating bird here, the American robin, which is almost a specialist on earthworms. During the summer, they, they uh, run along the, the, the ground and looking for traces of worms. We have a lot of worms in our front yard because the bird seed uh, creates a humus that the worms really like. And so we can watch ro robins uh, basically looking for wor worms. They move a few feet and stop and look around. They see one, rush over to it, grab it and pull it out of the ground. This one's taking its worms to its young now. Just a point that all these birds that eat particular things like insects or fish aren't necessarily, spe they're, they're specialists in them because they're very well adapted for eating them. Does not mean they can't eat something else. Many birds can eat things other than the things that they're specialized for. In the case of robins and other thrushes, fruit. So a robin feeds on insects and earthworms in the summer, but in, as winter comes and earthworms go underground, the insects sort of disappear, they turn to fruit. And a bird that's a territorial bird in your yard that chases other robins away all summer, then all of a sudden becomes very chummy with other robins and forms flocks, sometimes large flocks, travels around the countryside and looks for fruiting trees where they stop to eat until the fruiting tree is bare. The tropics are full of fruit eating birds because of course it's warm down there and the trees can fruit at any time of year. So in any given area, there are trees with fruit at almost any time of year. So birds like toucans and many others can specialize on those fruit. There's a whole array of tropical bird families that are fruit eaters. Toucans, large bills allow them to reach into clusters of fruit, pick them out from among the leaves. Uh, they also serve as, as heat radiators. Apparently a toucan can cool off by the heat radiating from that very large, pretty much hollow bill. Then there are seed eaters. Seeds, of course, are sort of like insects in the fact that they're universal. All plants, have, all seed plants have seeds. Um, they shed them to the environment. A bird that can eat those seeds has a pretty good uh, way of life. And of course, while insects are mostly gone in the winter, seeds are present all year long. So a lot of our sparrows and other seed eating birds are our common winter birds when the insect eaters have migrated south. So the, the bill of a bird like this has one mandible with a, a groove in it, the other mandible with a ridge. The sparrow catches that seed with its tongue, pushes it into that groove and cracks it with the ridge on the other mandible. And they can do that very rapidly as you can see by watching them at feeders. A bunch of seed eaters caught the eye of Charles Darwin many, many years ago when he was traveling in the Galapagos. And he realized that all these birds were so similar, but different in, the si in their size and their bill size. And he actually postulated that maybe they came from the same ancestor, they're so similar. And so that was one of the things he observed in the world that made him go on and eventually write, uh, come up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. So there are 18 species of Galapagos finches distributed among these islands. And they uh, range from the very large, large billed ground finch here, which eats really big seeds, to the small ground finch, sorry, large ground finch, to the small ground finch that eats small seed, to others that are variously specializing, cactus finch that eats cactus fiber, cactus fiber as well as seeds, uh, has a little bit more longer bill to do that, to the warbler finches, two species that actually have a slender bill like an insect eater and eat insects. So originally a seed eating bird came to the Galapagos and mod was evolved over time in these various insect, various islands, sorry, to eventually even one that actually now is able to eat insects. There are seed eating birds that, seeds are something that can last a long time. A plant sheds a seed and the seed can last for months and months and months until conditions are right for it to sprout. Um, so there are birds that take advantage of that and cash the seeds. Birds like chickadees, nuthatches, and certain kinds of, of corvids, Clark's nutcrackers and pinion jays and others, and even our cellar jays in our yard here that take peanuts and bury them in the ground. The Clark's nutcracker can take seeds from a white bark pine up in the alpine zone and take thousands of them over a period of late summer and fall and cache them in the ground all over its clove home range, even up to several miles away. And then during the winter, when many of these seeds are covered by snow, the nutcracker actually has ways to find them again. It's got landmarks telling it where these seeds are buried and they can dig them out and eat them during the winter when there's not much else to eat. So this caching behavior characteristic, of course, of, of northern, of high latitude birds. And then there's nectar feeding. Nectar's flower, again, plants are ubiquitous. 
most of them have flower, seed plants, most of them have flowered, they're the ones we call flowering plants, the angiosperms. Um, many of them are pollinated by animals, many, many by insects, uh, a few by bats and other mammals, and quite a few by birds. And the bird pollinated flowers are long tubes usually, which keeps bees out of them. A bee cannot get into something like that. They're red in coloration usually. Bees actually cannot see red, so they're not attracted to these flowers. Hummingbirds can see all colors, but they can, they can sort of recognize bird flowers as the ones to go to. And a long slender bill to probe into the flower, a long tongue that sort of curls into a tube and pulls the nectar out to swallow, and small wings that be very rapidly to allow them to hover at the mouths of each of these flowers and move from flower to flower. That's a hummingbird syndrome. It's only a new world group. In the Andes of Ecuador, we saw these two very large flowers with very, very uh, long corollas, a very, uh, or bracts, a, a deep, deep throated flower sort of. And you might wonder what could possibly pollinate a flower like that with such a huge, long, uh, a plant like that with such a huge long flower. Well, we already knew, of course, what pollinated them, this very, very special hummingbird that lives in the Andes of Ecuador. So hummingbirds have adapted from this species all the way down to very small species with very short bills that land on the ground in the high Andes and pollinate uh, very tiny flowers with those short bills. Amazing adaptive radiation within this family. And in the old world, there are sunbirds, uh, the ecological equivalent of hummingbirds. There are many, many of them are beautiful, shiny, iridescent, brightly colored birds. They have long, straight or curved bills, and they feed in flowers very much the way hummingbirds do, except they can't hover. They, they have to land on a branch to do it. So the flowers in the old world are actually rather different from hummingbird flowers because they don't, they're the birds that pollinate them don't have that hovering ability. And after all this eating, of course, uh, birds metabolize like everybody else does. They have to get rid of the, the, uh, the digested material, the material that isn't digested, and they poop. And they poop in long strings like this. Uh, big birds especially, like I just happened to catch this osprey doing off its nest. And that poop is mostly uric acid. Birds, mammals put their uh, excretory products into urea, which is solid, and birds do it in uric acid, which is uh, soluble in water. And that's what a bird does. And so you see these white spots from where birds have, have, have pooped. They have a, their urine and feces are combined. They have a single cloaca that takes in the urinary tract and the digestive tract and puts it into the cloaca and then comes out the single opening that they have called a vent. And that's what they do out the vent. Uh, all birds are like that with the exception of leaf eating birds. I didn't talk anything about leaf eating birds. That includes geese and grouse especially, and some other families. But these don't, uh, they actually have what looks more like mammalian feces. They poop out little particles like this. And you can sort of see this in Canada goose poop too in our city, uh, city parks, a mixture of this undigested vegetal ma uh, plant matter. Plants don't digest very well, leaves don't digest very well. So they actually are pooping out a lot of the undigested leaves, which you sort of see in Canada geese as well. In this case, these are spruce grouse, sort of pellets, if you want to call it, with sharp spruce needles in them. And I look at them and just think, ouch. And then birds uh, that eat stuff that's relatively undigestible animal matter, like hair and feathers and bones and mollusk shells, uh, regurgitate them out the front. They hold them in the stomach long enough to digest the soft material around them. And whatever's left is ejected as, as a regurgit is regurgitated. And so owls do this, owls do this, hawks do this, gulls do this, shorebirds do this. We see a lot of these in nature. And so we can gather them. It's kind of fun to gather up owl pellets, which I have done. And this, this I dissected out of four snowy owl pellets that were collected out at ocean shores in a big snowy owl winter and found out what, those, what they were eating. They eat water birds mostly when, they, when they're near the water. This owl, as dusk would fall, would fly out over the ocean and pick up things like horned greaves from the water. These are horned grebe bones. It would go along the shore and take shorebirds. These are all Sanderling and Dunlin bones. Really, really interesting to dissect out. A snowy owl in a field somewhere might have nothing but rat bones in it. They eat a lot of rats as well. And of course, after pooping and regurgitating and getting all messy, these birds have to take a bath. Birds bathe pretty much every day. 
uh, saltwater birds bathe in salt water, although you can see along coasts where rivers come out that they really seem to like to bathe in fresh water. A lot of the seabirds will come into the freshwater mouths of rivers to bathe. Sometimes they do it communally, like these starlings, looking like they have a great amount of fun. Sometimes they really, really get into it, just tremendous movement when they're bathing, trying to get that water under every single feather. And breeding, the other thing birds have to do is breed. They re reproduce, they have uh, offspring that lead to the next generation, they all do it. Uh, in many cases, the males uh, find and defend the territory like this red winged blackbird is doing and display in there. The display repels other males, allows them to maintain their territory and attracts females. In the case of red wing, it may attract two, three, four, five, ten 10 females even. Uh, Another member of its family, Montezuma oropetala, as it's singing, actually hangs under the branch. So displays can be pretty spectacular. Very often the female is involved, especially with a lot of seabirds, water birds. Uh, these Clark's Greaves are displaying. The female is a slightly smaller bird in the rear, but they just have a beautiful display that they do in synchrony. Western Greaves run along the water, both Western and Clark's Greaves then run along the water. Blue-footed boobies in the Galapagos, the male rocks back and forth on those spectacular blue feet, puts his head down and throws his wings up all in, in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, surely very impressive to the female. Frigate birds do it very differently. The males sit in the trees uh, in, your, in the nesting area and blow up this gigantic throat pouch they have and looks like a big red balloon and they wave their head around, wave their throat pouch and the females flying overhead looks down and sees this pretty spectacular male and comes lands next to him and is courted and eventually mates. A lot of members of the grouse family form Lex, L-E-K. This is a, when they get together, a whole bunch of males get together and strut around and display and chase each other around and actually bite for position because the males near the central part of the Lek are apparently the, the biggest, toughest, most successful males. And those are the ones the females mate with. Females come into the lek from outside, actually walk right by displaying males on the perimeter and go right into the central males and mate with them. And then the males have no part of parental care. So the female just goes off and lays her eggs and takes, takes care of her chicks. Of course, the most extreme uh, development of this, of this display in these chicken-like birds is in a blue peafowl. Absolutely un hard to believe how that could have even evolved. I would have loved to see all the intermediate stages, but it did evolve and it's there and it's very successful as long as the onlooker is in the front, at least. That's what you see if you sneak around the back. So those displays successful, the birds then mate, these, these black neck stilts are copulating, uh, a sort of a difficult thing for birds. Generally, they press their vents against one another and the male transfers sperm to the female looks very awkward with a long-legged bird like that. But it was successful and the still lays its eggs, the female lays her eggs and one or both sexes incubate them. Uh, these are ground nesting birds uh, and they build a little bit of a nest around the eggs. But the great majority of birds, of course, nest in elevated nests, much um, better uh, place to nest away from ground predators, obviously, like these great blue herons are doing. Uh, some of these birds nest in colonies, a mixed colony here, which we often see in great blue herons and double crested corvid. There's safety in numbers in birds, and so they get together in colonies like this. And the double crested cormorant is a fascinating species because it nests in tree nests very readily or builds its nests on rocky islands. There's very few birds that have that kind of variety in their nesting habits. A lot of the seabirds nest on islands, they're relatively safe from mammalian predators at least being out on these isolated islands, often right on the top of them like gannets do, or on cliff ledges on the side like kittiwakes do. And there are other ways to be, to be safe from predators, you nest deep in holes like bank swallows and kingfishers and bee eaters, some other birds do. Or build your nest out of mud with a hole in one sewer. Again, not many predators can get to that. Again, so then you can be colonial and nests like these fairy martins are doing. Notice the house sparrows, which don't build a nest, but take over some of them. Most birds though nest by themselves on a cup nest. That's a, a typical thing for the great majority of perching birds, uh, which, of which about half the birds species are perching birds, like this Phoebe is doing. 
They lay a clutch of eggs. So eggs can vary from one up to as many as about 15, one in quite a few seabirds, 15 in gallinaceous birds and ducks that uh, don't have to feed their young so they can lay a lot of eggs. Uh, the eggs that are in hidden places like wrens that nest in crevices and, and hollows are usually uncolored or white. Those that nest on the ground are usually patterned and camouflaged. This is just six different clutches of killdeers from various times and places showing the variation you can have in these camouflaged eggs. And then the eggs hatch and the young start growing. These are altricial young. Altricial young are birds that uh, young that are born blind, naked, totally helpless. All they are is, as I said before, just a big colored gape of the mouth that the adults come in and feed. This shows the progression in a single nest that I was watching, May 5th, May 14th, May 20th, and May 31st. These birds grow fairly rapidly in about a month. They grow from little tiny newborns, new hatched, to birds fledged, almost ready to leave the nest. Uh, did you know that young crows have blue eyes? That's something that's really, I was excited to learn that. Uh, some young stay in the nest a lot longer. Seabirds uh, have to go flying on long flights to catch fish to feed their young. So they don't feed them very much and very fast. And they grow slowly. Red-footed booby young stay in the nest for three months until they fledge and can fly away. King penguins have the record. They are, uh, they stay as young for about 14 months. So they grow slowly. Again, the adults can't fly to sea. They have to actually swim out to sea to catch fish for the young. And so they grow slowly and they're very large. And so they actually have to overwinter as, as downy young. So they're born in the summer, hatched in the summer. They go through the next winter when it's very cold in the Falkland Islands in the Southern winter. And they're so incredibly heavily encased with down that they can stay warm through that. Just, and they often huddle together in groups uh, to stay warm. And then as the next summer comes, at some point they start develop, developing the adult feathers and can, and can leave the breeding colony. Birds feed their young when they're young. They're, the, these altricial birds have to be fed. So it's all passerine birds and many other kinds of birds fly out from the nest, gather food of some sort or another and bring them back to the nest. In the case of barn swallows, insects. In the case of hummingbirds, a mixture of insects and nectar, the birds stay in the nest until they're quite large, almost ready to fledge. Uh, all hummingbirds lay two eggs, probably because their nests are very tiny and they couldn't possibly hold more than two young. Birds are fed after they leave the nest in many cases. Uh, and this is a semi-precocial young. A young coot is born with down feathers, is active and able to uh, leave the nest fairly quickly and locomote on its own and move around after its parents. The parents move it around through different habitats. The adult dives for plant matter, brings it back and feeds it to the young. Or a grebe, the grebe dives for fish and bring them back and feed to the young. This young, I watched this young in horror, but it actually did manage to swallow this little uh, loach eventually. Uh, birds, these birds take very good care of their young. The young can even ride on the backs of, of greaves or loons. And even when they're small, the adult actually dives with them, sort of held, held under the wing feathers. And then uh, they make a really delightful thing to see. These are fully precocial young. These not only uh, are born with down feathers and they can leave the nest quickly and be very active walking or swimming, but they feed themselves. So waterfowl, unlike the coots and the greaves, the waterfowl young feed themselves. The adults don't do that at all. All they have to do is sort of shepherd the young around, take them to good habitats, warn them of predators, feed and uh, uh, protect them if they can. Same is true with shorebirds. They all have these precocial young, leave the nest very quickly, feed for themselves. Same is true for gallinaceous birds, chickens and their relatives. These birds are on land. They're more susceptible to predation than those ducks that are out in the water. So these birds have evolved distraction displays. If a predator approaches a fox or a crow or something like that, the adult just goes crazy, displaying bright colors, calling, uh, running along the ground like it's got a broken wing, and eventually can lead the predator away from the young, at least if they're, if they're doing it right and if they're lucky, they can. Uh, in some cases, there's no distraction display. The adult bird just tries to chase the predator away. Uh, a tiny brewer's blackbird landing on the back of a golden eagle, pecking it, uh, pulling on its tail feathers, 
usually is enough bothersome to drive the predator away, actually. And I've seen that a number of times. Small kingbirds and blackbirds, very good at chasing raptors away from their nesting territories. Uh, these birds are, uh, most birds have mate, uh, mate every breeding season. Most small birds come together in the breeding season. If the male and female find each other, they mate again. They sort of are in the same territory. They may or may not use the same nest. Larger birds, which build bigger nests and the nests are sort of more valuable and the birds are less common. So it's not that easy to find a mate, tend to always come back to the same site and usually will find the same mate unless the mate has died. Sometimes they get divorces uh, and, just do, and just choose another mate. Uh, then some birds mate for life. Uh, big hawks, eagles, ravens, ravens and crows stay together all winter. So rather than trying to find each other in the breeding season, they just assure that they'll have a mate for the next year by remaining together all year. Marble murrelets are probably the smallest bird that does that. Marble murrelets, marble murrelets nest on high in conifer trees in old growth forests. And that must be very hard to find a murrelet mate if you're in an old growth forest. And so they basically stay together all their life. They stay together all winter long. Each one dives to catch fish. When it surfaces, it starts calling to attract the other one back to it. They're really, really tightly paired. That's sort of wonderful things to watch. Uh, some birds have very different mating systems. Most birds are monogamous, males and females. One male, one female raise, raise the young. Uh, phalaropes are what we call polyandrous. The females in the back are a little larger, more brightly colored. They actually court the males not the reverse as we see in most birds. And when a male, when they've convinced a male to mate with them, they will mate, the female will lay, the male builds the nest, female lays eggs in it and then leaves. She has nothing to do with the young anymore. The male incubates the eggs and raises the young. She may well mate with another male and do the same thing. In some polyandrous birds like spotted sandpipers, then they may actually, the female may mate with a male and then become monogamous with the, with the third male and just uh, raise the young together. Cowbirds are brood parasites. That's another way of having, having young, another way of reproducing. They do not build a nest. They do not raise their own young. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. The female comes along early in the morning and actually takes the vireo egg out of the nest, drops it on the ground, lays one of hers in, in, uh, in exchange. The adult bird seems not to know the difference, except in some species that do know the difference and actually pierce the cowbird egg and throw it out of their nest. That's a whole big story in itself. Uh, there are brood parasites all over the world. Most of the members of the cuckoo family are brood parasites. Here's a channel bill cuckoo, the adult laid an egg in a pied currawong nest in Southern Australia. And this young was following the adult around, begging very loud cries, begging from it as we watched it. Uh, in many cases, the brood parasite actually is bigger than the adult bird, but the adult still comes and feeds it as if it were its own young. And there's my, how am I doing for time? Do I have another five, 10 minutes? Um, you have, it's 8.06. So yeah, um, another maybe 10 minutes and we'll okay. leave a few minutes for questions. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and then we talk about migration. Migration is a very special thing, uh, much more common in birds than any other group of organisms. There are insects that migrate and mammals that migrate and salamanders that migrate, but nothing like birds, which have been able to colonize very high latitudes uh, all over the world because of this ability to migrate. Here's a Western tanager. It uh, breeds in, in through much of Western North America in the summer. It's primarily an insect eater. It catches insects for its own self and feeds to its young, sort of like the robin change, like I told you before. Then it flies to the tropics where it's warmer and where there's fruit available all winter. And so it can actually turn to a diet of fruit and tanagers are fruit eaters in the tropics. But then it comes up here the next year in migration and switches its diet to insects, which are abundant and dependable and very good protein food for its young. Migration distances and places that birds go are very much tied into what they eat. Uh, Swainson's uh, red-tailed hawk in the bottom eats rodents and other small animals, and it's pretty much resin. It's partially migratory. It, really, it leaves the northern part of its breeding range. The blue is, is summer range. The green is all year range, I should have said. Um, leaves the northern part of its range just because 
heavy snow pretty much keeps it from finding the rodents that it normally eats. But still, a lot of them are resident, as you can see. Swainson's hawk, on the other hand, eats largely insects. There are no insects present in the winter in that part of its range. So they migrate all the way to Argentina for the winter, which is sort of a comparable latitude, which is full of insects in our winter, which of course is Argentina's summer. So it sort of moves back and forth, these long, long flights, and has summer all year long and abundant food all year long by doing that. Closely related birds with very different migratory habits. Bartail godwit, that's an amazing bird. That's got the longest flight, longest single flight of any bird in the world. Uh, they do not land in the ocean. They fly from Southern Alaska to New Zealand in their migration. They winter in New Zealand, then they come back to Alaska in the summer. And I had to write this down because I couldn't remember all these numbers. They've tracked by radio transmitters. People put radio transmitters on Godwits in Alaska, tracked them on their flight to New Zealand. They tracked them 7,000 miles in a single flight, which makes them number one, as I said, in, in an, a, single, a single bird flight without landing from Alaska to New Zealand. At 40 miles an hour, their average speed, the flight takes 175 hours equals one week. So they're over the ocean for a week going down to New Zealand and coming back to Alaska. They increase their weight by 55% by eating. They feed fantastically. It's called hyperphagia, really heavy, heavy duty feeding almost all day long and even into the evening. While they resorb up to 25% of their innards, their gut, their kidney, and their liver actually become smaller. They take uh, material away from those organs to lighten their weight because they are eating so much that all that fat they deposit raises their weight. So they're depositing fat under their skin and in their viscera and, and all over the body. And they live off that fat while they're migrating over the ocean for a week. That's what is giving them energy. So they're losing weight as they go. They're getting better and better uh, at, at flying because they're losing weight all the time. The basal metabolic rate is raised eight to 10 times above normal uh, during their flight. And those are really, really high metabolic rate, high heartbeat rate, high everything to give them the energy to make this incredible long flight. When they arrive in New Zealand, they regenerate those tissues of their gut so they can begin to feed again. And I, they, they haven't been tracked from New Zealand to Alaska. This is all southbound flight, but presumably the northbound flight may be something like that. Although it's actually known that some of them actually go over to Asia on their way, so they don't have quite such a long flight in the spring. Here's another record breaker, the Arctic Tern, a quarter pound bird with the longest flight uh, flights in its life, but they can land. They land on driftwood in the ocean. They can, so it's not a single flight, but they fly the longest distances of any birds up to 50,000 miles in a year, going from way up in the Arctic as a breeder to way down in the Antarctic in the winter. So they're in similar positions. The Ar Antarctic in our Winter is, of course, in summer with a lot of productivity, a lot of fish, a lot of fur. Ten of these birds were fitted with geolocators. Geolocators are a relatively new thing, which actually uh, have a, are light sensitive. And so they measure the time of sunrise and sunset. And so if you if and then there's a bio, there's a clock built into them. So by using that combination of a known time and when sunset and sunrise occurs, they can easily tell the latitude of the bird. These are different at every latitude. So they can track these birds over long, long distances of changing latitudes. A single Arctic tern, which may live as much as 30 years, may fly up to 1.5 million miles during its lifetime, which is to the moon and back three times. And I think I'll leave you with that as the most incredible, one of the many, many, many incredible things about birds. Oh, this is one more thing, Sooty Shearwater. I should have, uh, this is a photograph from Washington. These breed in New Zealand, and they have many, many, many of them have been fit with, uh, have been fitted with radio tags that transmit their location, and they're tracked by satellites. They're not tracked from land, they're actually tracked from satellites in orbit. And these are the flight paths of individual sooty shearwaters across to South America, up into the North Pacific, spending the summer in the North Pacific, including very abundantly off our coast, some of them going across to Japan and Russia, even up to Southern Alaska, and then coming back to New Zealand. And so each of these things is the, is the flight of an individual bird. Isn't that incredible? And I guess that's what I can leave you with. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Well, good enough. Anyway, the end and uh, 
that, that's it. I have, a, I have a picture of these geese flying the other way as if they're migrating the other way in the end. That's it. Thank you. So Dennis, can you stop your screen share? We'll both pop into view. Yes. Okay. So thank you actually for a fast paced, holy mackerel. You had a lot of slides with some pretty amazing photographs. Um, so we do have, I see one question in um, the Q and A. And I would just remind people if you have questions, um, you can uh, type them into the Q&A and I'll read them aloud to Dennis or he may see them himself. I'm not exactly sure. I don't see them right now, no. Okay, so Dennis, the first question that I have is from Meg, whose question was, where would you recommend to go region or city in Costa Rica to see the most colorful and diverse in size birds? Oh boy. Um, uh I, in a way, you could say almost anywhere. Uh, you could go to Rancho Naturalista on the Caribbean side. Uh, you could go to the Osa Peninsula where there's quite a few lodges. Um, you can go to the area around La Fortuna, which is on the east side of the mountain range where there are lodges. You can go well up into the mountains. There's lodges, uh, Sabegre Lodge. And, and again, you can find these in actually looking for birding lodges in Costa Rica, looking online. Uh, they're all just wonderful and they're all different because Costa Rica, you can go up to 10,000 feet in elevation on the Pan American Highway and see completely different birds than you can see in the lowlands on the Caribbean side, completely different birds than in the lowlands on the Pacific side uh, because the country varies. It's a very small country, half the size of New York, but it just varies so much in climate much wetter to much drier and an elevation. And everywhere you go, the birds are wonderful. The Osa Peninsula is a wonder. Uh, a place called Laguna del Lagarto Lodge is where I photographed the brown hooded parrot feeding the young and the keel build toucan. They have banana feeders there that are just wonderful. And it's rainforest all around. And it's just, you know, anywhere down there is great as far as I spend a lot of, I've been to Costa Rica like eight times and I lived there for a year. Okay, we've got some more questions coming in, Dennis. A uh, question from Mary. How many birds are on your life list? Well, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere over 4,000, I think, maybe over 4,100. Yeah. And I'll do a follow-up question. How many photographs do you have? Uh, 65,000 slides and 200,000 digital photos. Okay, wow. <laughs> it, amaz it amazes even me when I think of those numbers. Okay, I have a question that's come in from Facebook. Uh, speaking of migration, maybe it's just the year, but it seems like there are fewer birds this bird fest than previous years. I found several species missing from the area I usually take my guests. Have you seen similar trends this year? I'm wondering how big an effect the mass die off this fall in the desert southwest has had on our birds. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, uh, we have a, a birding listserv called Tweeters, which many, many people are on and many people have remarked the very same thing. And yet a few people have said, no, right in my neighborhood, it's absolutely normal. So there's some variation clearly, but we know birds are declining all the time in the world on this continent and especially neotropical migrants. The birds that fly to the tropics for the winter and then come back here for the breeding season because those are affected on their breeding grounds by loss of habitat and other things on their migration by storms or the, apparently the huge fires that we had along the pacific coast last year people were very concerned that the smoke from those fires would actually affect birds migrating over would get in their lungs and they couldn't breathe very well and we don't have any proof for that but there's some some evidence that that might be the case the big die off in the Southwest was probably mostly for birds that migrated through the Rocky Mountains. So it was probably a much greater effect in the Rocky Mountain states than on the Pacific states. But some of those birds could have been our birds and that could have had an effect. It is, it's a puzzle. We sort of, one possibility is that the migration is later than usual, although I don't know why it would be. And so maybe more birds will be coming in. But yeah, quite a few people have said that. And, and it's a, uh, one person said maybe it's a pandemic effect. Maybe we're we're just we're just tired of everything. And so we're seeing not as many birds as we want to see. I don't know. Okay, I have another Facebook question. Uh, do all birds come from a common ancestor? You bet they do. 
a long, a long road from those Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor through these various feathered dinosaurs to some early type of bird like Archaeopteryx to, to all the birds we have now, yeah. And another Facebook question, does this seem to be a low warbler year for Western Washington? Well, that's the same thing as the previous question. There seem to be fewer people seeing fewer warblers, yeah. Fewer everything, fewer flycatchers, fewer tanagers. I certainly noticed it in my yard. Yeah. So I got a good question, uh, Zoom question from Peter. Why isn't mobbing more common? Silver gulls eat black knotty chicks while a tree full of them complain without mobbing. Yeah, very good question. Some birds just may, may not have evolved that behavior. I mean, it is a behavior pattern that is very strong in birds like kingbirds, for example, and blackbirds, as I said, crows mob anything that flies through their territory, uh, any kind of raptor, owl, hawk, eagle, uh, ravens, anything bigger. And, and they do a pretty good job of driving them off. Uh, and But yeah, and some small birds mob predatory birds, even like chickadees and things like that. Not very effectively though. They just sort of hang around. Basically mobbing is calling attention to the predator. And so calling attention at least warns all the other individuals in the area and birds can understand the mobbing calls of other species. And it does, it also distracts the predator and it makes it obvious, I guess it makes it obvious to the predator if it's got that level of brain power that it's been seen, it's been noticed, probably not a good place to try to hunt. So that's probably the main thing that mobbing does. But then some birds take that farther and actually chase birds, like I showed that Western kingbird doing with the eagle. And the black the, the black noddies apparently just haven't evolved. I mean, I've gone to turn colonies and had the turns fly right at me. So some turns certainly do mob potential predators. But for some reason, maybe those noddies don't. I don't know. So another question, uh, what about the bird populations in Australia? now after the fires? Severely affected. We were in Australia two winters ago and uh, for a month and I was just amazed at how many fewer birds I saw in some parts of the country than I was used to. I mean, it's not that the birds are all gone, you see the species, but it still seemed, population seemed low. And I'm a, I'm a general naturalist, so I was more shocked at the lack of butterflies and other insects and reptiles in areas that I had been before and seen lots and lots of them. But birds, birds seem down somewhat too. Huge drought uh, was probably the worst thing because it dried up water holes that made the plants shrivel It certainly reduced insect populations. All those would have affected birds. And so, yeah, there's an effect, but, but regional, not overall of Australia. Okay, another uh, question coming in. Uh, how can birds eat something so much larger than their throats? Well, Bulls it, eating a starfish. Yeah, uh, usually I've got photos of gulls with starfish stuck in their beaks where they couldn't swallow them. So they usually probably can't swallow a whole starfish unless it's a soft enough starfish that they can fold all the legs and get it down. But I agree, I've seen that. It's, it's always amazing. And these great blue herons eating things that are way bigger than the diameter of their head. Their bill opens up at the base. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the bill is not solid. It's sort of expandable, like I said about the pelican's lower mandible. And, uh, and the throat is, you know, throat is, is flexible, quite flexible in cormorants and herons, just as an adaptation to be able to swallow large prey, I guess. I mean, something like a big eagle can't, can't eat anything like as large a prey they have to, but they've got the adaptation with their hooked bill to pick it apart in pieces too. So these other birds like cormorants and gulls can't tear apart prey. So they, all they can eat is what they can swallow whole. Another question from Facebook. We just visited the Southwest where it was really dry. What do the birds do when they stop for water and there isn't any? They have many birds have to have water, so they they go away or maybe die. I don't know. We you know we don't have a lot of we don't have controlled experiments of, of that sort. But that's all I could conclude is that they can only go so long without drinking, and then they have to either leave or or perish. So drought, yeah, drought is a terrible thing, one of the worst effects of climate change. 
So uh, can the populations in the Pacific Northwest rebound after the die off last year? I would say probably most populations do rebound after something like that, as long as there are still enough individuals left to, to recolonize, to have young. And it depends a lot on what, what some of these changes do to the prey, whether it's fruit or seeds or insects, as long as the prey is still abundant, the birds will you know, breed successfully and little by little increase in numbers, they should. And the last Facebook question I see here is, uh, does the bar-tailed godwit store enough water to make that trip without drinking? Yeah, it can get, it gets, I guess it gets water from the fat, you know, because they don't drink salt water. I mean, they don't land, so they can't, they can't drink anything, yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure it's the fat, the metabolism of the fat is giving them enough water. So on that note, Dennis, I, I thank you for uh, quite a um, interesting presentation and certainly some fabulous photos that really demonstrate all those adaptations you were talking about. Um, you reminded me of things I learned in my undergraduate zoology degree that I had forgotten. Uh -huh. So it was a fast paced uh, bachelor's degree in zoology that we just went through, I think. That's so great. I thank you. Thank you for my that. Pleasure. I taught zoology. I taught zoology in college for years, so that's sort of what I still want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, those of you that are still on the call, I do want to um, uh, let you know that uh, Rachel, who's running the Facebook uh, um, side of the house, uh, said this recording will actually live on forever uh, on YouTube, so it won't just be around for a month. So that's oh. a good reminder. Yay! <laughs> Yay! And then a couple of things just to know their um, bird fest tomorrow's the last day. There still are a couple of activities that have a few openings, at least when I checked there at the very end of Dennis's presentation. Uh, birding on Bluet Pass that starts at eight in the morning has two openings. Birding up the number two canyon has one opening that starts at eight. Uh, bird friendly property tours starts at nine. Those of you that want to sleep in a little bit more. And then bike and birding also has a couple openings. So tomorrow's the last day. I hope you've enjoyed BirdFest. Uh, take a look at the other things that are on the Wenatchee River Institute website for activities. We're going more live, less virtual, uh, as is probably most of the US. Um, so we're excited to roll out some new, uh, some new programs and some new activities. So stay tuned. And Dennis, again, thank you very much. I will give the applause for you. Silent <laughs> applause. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed it a lot, and I hope everybody else did. All righty. Well, thanks again. Okay. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rachel, too. <laughs>